complete this evening. I love the intentionality of those lyrics. Even when life gets tough, when we have suffering in our hearts, we can still say, yes, I will give praise to God. And that's why we're here this morning. So it is good to see all of you here. After those who are worshiping with us for the first time, I want to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, we are delighted to uh, be in the Lord's presence with you on this uh, beautiful sun summer morning. A couple announcements I want to put on your radars, the first of which is next Saturday, August 10th. We are going to have our tailgate and night of worship. Um, so at 5 p.m. we'll be here at the church to bring uh, your favorite tailgate food uh, to share, wear your college uh, colors, whether you went to school there or just like to support them. Uh, bring that, and then uh, at 6.30 we will come into the worship room and have a night of worship, and uh, we will just sing out praise to God uh, for a couple of hours. What a delight that will be. On Sunday, August 11th, uh, we are going to have uh, Chris Gardner here, who is the son-in-law of Richard Haney, Swift Creek's founding pastor. He's going to be here to do our meeting for ministry, but also between services, he's going to meet with us for about 30 minutes, uh, for those who are interested in the large Sunday school classroom, to share a little bit about the work that he is doing, the important work he is doing over in Asia. So if you can be here for that, uh, it will be a fascinating time to learn more about what he's doing, and uh, he will be here again at 1015 Large Sunday School Classroom. And at this time, I'm going to invite Joe to come forward. I have a special introduction uh, I want to make this morning, and that is to introduce Marina Dolly, our new director. Uh, Marina and I have known each other for probably about four years now. We, I met her taking summer Greek. It was the first thing we both did in seminary. I meant to bring our Greek flashcards, but I forgot. Uh, but just delighted to have you here and I'm so excited for, uh, for the youth and uh, for all of us as we uh, will uh, move forward under your leadership. So thanks for coming. Who's somebody you want to introduce to your family? Uh, yes, my parents are back there. <laughs> uh, thank you, David and Joe, for uh, this opportunity, and I'm super excited to be a part of Swift Creek and all that God is doing in this church. I'm very excited. I met some of the youth already, but if I've not met you, please introduce yourself to me. I've been praying for each of you by name, and I've been praying for this ministry, and I'm really excited to see what God has in store uh, for this youth ministry this season. So thank you again. Thank you. And a reminder tonight, we have a combined, uh, combined youth group, right, starting at 5 p.m. So whether you're middle school or high school, be here at 5 p.m. We've got water kickball, uh, we've got dinner, and then the lessons for the excitement for that. Um, you know, over the last four years, uh, <coughs> last few years, I should say, uh, we have had someone who has been integral in, uh, in the running of youth group. And uh, Joe, can you give a few words? Uh, Sherry, if you could come up, please. Sherry Dismo, for those of you who are familiar with our youth group, <laughs> so for those of you who are familiar with Sunday nights, it's an important night for our youth group where there's fellowship, they hear the word, and part of that fellowship is dinner, where the middle schoolers and the high schoolers uh, get a chance to come together and have dinner. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that for the past six plus years. I think over 300, Wendy and I talked over 300 meals. Sherry has planned what was to be served, has gone out and bought what was to be served, has coordinated those who would be serving, those who would be cleaning up after, the, after serving the meal. And Sherry came to us in June and said she'd like to have a little break. But <laughs> I can't blame her for that. So we wanted to recognize Sherry today for all that she's done for our youth group. Uh, on Sunday evenings. It's, it's a lot of work and she's uh, greatly missed, but uh, I understand. We thought it was fitting to get her a gift card to go out to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. And with that, the children are dismissed for children's worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts you have given us. And as we give a portion of our gifts back to you as an act of worship, we ask that you bless it 
and he was afraid of the Lord, and Jesus saw him pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes again from the book of Romans. I'll be reading from chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Uh, but just to catch you up on where we ended up a few weeks ago, uh, we've gotten to the very first two verses of chapter 8, where uh, we are told that we have uh, life through the spirit of life uh, given to us through Jesus Christ. Uh, and so as Paul goes on in chapter 8, he begins to speak about, to write about the reality of suffering that we contend with. We have this present suffering, but we're promised a future glory. And so he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. He has this present suffering that he's dealing with, uh, but he's looking ahead to the future. And this verse is uh, pretty well known, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. And so Paul's wrestling with the fact that he's got some things going on in his life. Uh, when he's writing this letter to the church in Rome, he is uh, getting ready to go to Jerusalem to present this offering to the church in Jerusalem. And yet he, he realizes that he is a hated man by some people. They see him as an unfaithful Jew because he is carrying this gospel of Jesus Christ. But as Paul's writing this letter, he also recognizes that he wants to head to Rome. He wants to visit with the church in Rome. So he's going to bring this gospel about Jesus Christ the king of the Jews, into the heart of the Roman Empire. And he knows there's inherent danger in that as well. And so he says to us this morning, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So for those of you who have been here uh, throughout our uh, study of Romans this summer, you may have picked up on the fact that Paul employs a certain rhetorical technique uh, throughout uh, the first half, certainly, of this letter. He asks a lot of questions. Now, you might think of them as rhetorical questions, things that he puts up for us to consider, uh, but they're actually not rhetorical questions. There's a specific name for these types of questions. Because Paul doesn't just ask them and then kind of leave the answer dangling for us to consider. He asks the question, and then he goes and answers it. And these are called hypothetics. Have you heard of that term before? I had never heard it in my life until I thinking this week. Uh, so he uses these hypophores throughout Romans, and here's just a small sampling of how he uses these. He will ask the question and then answer it immediately. He's asking the question that you are already thinking about, but then he answers it for you. So he says, what advantage then is there in being a Jew, or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. Paul goes on to ask, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The 
law that requires works? No, the law that requires faith. That's chapter 3. Chapter 6. What then shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. He keeps asking these questions and immediately answers them for the reader, for the hearer of his letter. So he uses these, he peppers them throughout this letter to the church in Rome. Of Rome. Um, they kind of come frequently, but not too close together initially. You know, we kind of get, it's like a fireworks display. You get one here, one here, and they kind of come at us at a steady cadence. He asks the question and then takes a paragraph or so to answer the question. And then we get to verse 31. And just like that fireworks display, man, he's going to hit these things rapid fire. They're going to come at us one after the other, other after the other. And he's going to answer the questions again, but the questions come rapid fire. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who then is the one who condemns? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Seven questions, one after the other. And Paul is asking questions about suffering. About the suffering that he is experiencing, the suffering that the church in Rome experiences, the suffering that you experience, sometimes on a daily basis. So we're hearing questions about suffering. He rattles then off the quotation from Psalm 44. Did you pick it up? For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. From Psalm 44. It's the first of 11 lament psalms we have in the Psalter, the book of Psalms. A lament psalm. The people are crying out because of their suffering. But interestingly, the way this psalm starts, they are grateful for the things God has done in the past, for uh, guiding them, for shepherding them. And so Psalm 44 begins with this. We have heard it with our ears, O God. Our ancestors have told us what you did in their days, the days long ago. With your hand, you drove out the nations and planted our ancestors. You crushed the peoples and made our ancestors flourish. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand, your arm, God, and the light of your face. We love them. But then the tables turn. The people of Israel start being attacked from outside, and they are succumbing to their enemies. And so the psalmist cries out amidst But now you have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out with our armies. You made us retreat before the enemy, and our adversaries have plundered us. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep, and then scattered us among the nations. All this while one of the few times the people of Israel actually being faithful. 
time and again we hear about how the people of Israel turn away from God and then he seeks them and calls them back in. This suffering they're experiencing happens while the people are being faithful. They're going to church every week. They're saying their prayers. They're teaching their children to walk in the ways of God. And yet they experience this suffering. He says, all this came upon us, even though we had not forgotten you. We had not been false to your covenant, God. Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet had not strayed from your path. But you crushed us and made us a haunt for jackals. You covered us over with deep darkness. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, wouldn't you have discovered it? Since you know, God, the secrets of our heart, yet for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. And so the psalmist cries out, Awake, Lord! Why do you sleep? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us. Thank you, writer of Psalm 44, for saying the things that we sometimes think and feel. Why do we experience this suffering in a time and in a place where we're told God is good and faithful and all-knowing and all-loving? Why do we face this suffering when we're doing the right thing? The psalmist ends with these words. Rescue us because of your unfailing. The psalmist is grateful in the beginning for all that God has done. But in the time of suffering, he cries out and wonders, where is God in this moment? But then he confesses. Rescue me because of your unfailing love. And so Paul says this morning, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's in response to those questions that he's asking about suffering, rapid fire. Listen to the questions again. The first five are kind of given in a courtroom setting. It's a trial. But then the last two is a pivot. So here again. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us these things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? He answers the question. It is God who justifies. And then Paul goes on. Who then is the one who condemns? He answers the question, no one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, the Father, and he intercedes for us. We cannot be condemned because Christ is our advocate at the right hand of God. But then there's a pivot. We move from this courtroom metaphor to love. Paul asks, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble? Or hardship? How about persecution or Famine, or nakedness, or danger.
injured or sore. Paul had experienced these things already in his life or knew that he would be facing them sometime in the future. Paul asked these five questions about, well, there's seven questions total about suffering. The first five in that courtroom language. But then he moves from the head to the heart. And he begins to speak about love. Those first five questions are this fantastic argument filled with reason and logic because he asks the question and then he answers it for the hero. <laughs> Romans 5 through 8 is this huge argument. It's a logical, reasoned argument for why we have freedom in Jesus Christ. Go through it. We've gone through it these last few weeks. But then Paul takes that argument and he sets it aside and, has, and says, guess what, folks? All of this has been about God's love. So this morning, we can hear Paul say, neither death nor life will separate us from the love of God who is in Jesus Christ. Neither death nor life, neither anxiety or depression, neither job loss, nor financial strain, neither family hardship or addiction. Nothing, neither time nor space, neither sin nor shame can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so Paul says, we are more We are more than conquerors. The score isn't close. Come on. Come on. This time I'm going to invite Mark Pepco to come forward. Uh, he and I had a chance to have lunch I said a few weeks ago on the Facebook video, but I think it was a few months, a few months ago. ago. Yeah. <laughs> he has an amazing testimony and uh, was willing to share it with us this morning. And so, turn it over to you. All right. Good morning. David just said, I just uh, a couple months ago we had lunch together and I shared a couple things about a couple stories about my dad with him, and he asked uh, if I would be willing to share that with the congregation. So uh, we didn't want to hold the risk. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was a Christian, he attended uh, St. Paul's Church in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Uh, he was an engineer with uh, two degrees, one in chemical and one in structural engineering. Uh, he worked for a company called Bernay Laboratories. It's a, uh, they manufacture products like, uh, if you hold up an aerosol can, there's a little rubber plug at the bottom, they make that rubber plug. And everybody knows what a, a ballpoint pen is, they make the ball in the ballpoint pen. I don't know if they still do that now, but Uh, he was a plant manager and a safety director for a time. Um, in his spare time, he enjoyed doing mechanics. Um, God blessed him with all kinds of uh, skills like carpentry. He could work on any car engine, any small engine. He had a 15 by 25 foot garden, so he was a gardener also. And uh, his passion was flying. He was a small engine aircraft pilot. And uh, another thing he was, was I would say he was, he was medium strict. Uh, he had a decent sense of humor. Uh, he had no tolerance for foul language, uh, except on one occasion. Uh, we were, uh, I think I was 10 years old when we were visiting Disney World. And um, we, my brother and I wanted to ride Space Mountain. And that would have been my first roller coaster. And I know it was my dad's first roller coaster ride, and I know it was his last also. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my brother got in his own car. My brother's a year older than me. He got in his own car, and then I got in the car with with my dad, and I kind of, you know, I sat between his legs, and uh, we ascended the first drop. And then as we went over that drop and descended, I yelled out my first unsavory word. <laughs> 
I won't say that word here, but it was prefaced by the word hopeful. <laughs> in, in mid January 2016, oh, wait a minute, uh, he, he had no tolerance for, uh, for disrespecting him or my mother, especially my mother. Uh, one time, uh, he, was, he actually flew us to his parents' 50th wedding anniversary. And he was the pilot, my mom was in the co pilot seat, and my brother and I were in the back seat. And on the way, my brother and I started fighting, uh, you know, hitting each other, wrestling and stuff. And my mom told us to stop, and uh, we did for a minute, and then we started back up again, and, and, and you know, started fighting, and my mom told us to stop again, and then uh, we started back up again, and then all of a sudden, we found ourselves clinging for dear life on the side of the aircraft. And my dad started dipping the wings of the aircraft like this. And, you know, we're yelling, we're like, are we going to crash? Are we crashing? And he's just like, no, no, we're not going to crash. This only occurs when you disrespect your mother inside of an aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> so we were seated statues the rest of the trip. In mid-January 2016, dad informed me that there was a, a my dad had heart disease, unfortunately. And uh, he told me that there was a donated heart waiting for him and that he was going to stop treatment of his heart disease and let the other person have the heart. And I was in, I was working in Korea at the time, and he, so he told me this over FaceTime. And so I had a lot of emotions going on, and, you know, he kind of calmed me down, was like, you know, um, he told me that he had a wonderful life and that God had, had just blessed him, uh, just gave him a life full of blessings. And over the next few weeks, I kept in close contact with him via FaceTime. And my brother flew down from Michigan to go see him. He was in Florida, my dad was. And, um, and during that time, uh, I witnessed, uh, you, know, you know, someone with uh, an amazing, amazing strength. Um, he, had, he still had a sense of humor. He, uh, he would only eat ice and ready with. And uh, over those next few weeks, um, I witnessed a man who was at peace with his decision, and he had such a unique confidence about his future uh, that it would give anyone a shot in the arm, you know, get fair. And it was like his bags were packed, and he was ready to go on the field. And he died on February 8th. 2016, and I have had struggles with my faith over the decades, um, but over the last three years, I've, I've found a capture. I've captured my faith, and there's no turning back. I've uh, been reading the Bible regularly, and through my understanding of Scripture, I've come to understand what my dad understood long ago and about the fear of God. Not a scary kind of fear, but a recognition of the reverence of God, the sovereign of God. And it reveals how God, it reveals to me how God has been working in my life from birth to present. And every day it continues to you know, put me in awe. To sum up my dad as a Christian, I would say he was a man of James and a, uh, with the faith of Paul. Some items in his pack bags. Uh, to begin with, he and my mother adopted two orphans. Uh, my brother at the age of one and myself at the age of three months. Uh, he's not an overly evangelical guy. He, uh, he didn't try to convert me and my siblings to Christianity uh, or make it a family requirement. He simply exposed us to it. And to his best, he lived his life as an example to us. He was a kind, soft-spoken person. He never tore anyone down. He attended church every Sunday, even on vacations. He thanked God before every meal. He volunteered for countless projects and needs within the church and our community for over 40 years. Uh, he, he was an original church lecturer at his church. He was also the church cemetery board secretary and treasurer. And he was also responsible for the disposition of graves. Uh, our church when I was growing up had a, had their own cemetery. So 
he was in charge of uh, basically the small graves for cremains. And um, it was a job nobody wanted, but you know, my dad just gave it a second thought. Uh, and yes, he endured some family graveyard jokes. Um, my mom gave him the nickname Backhoe Beto. <laughs> Don't give me ideas. <laughs> Uh, he was an extremely dependable person. He volunteered to design and help construct homes for Habitat for Humanity in and around the county. And um, there, there are towns, there are cities. I came from a village. We were it was the village of Carroll Springs. And uh, my mother assisted in the managing of the village emergency welfare fund. And she and my dad volunteered to head up uh, the food pantry. And so he converted half of our garage into a food pantry. And uh, he assisted my mom with its management for, this was from the time I was in elementary school to, to the age of 36. And uh, he often said to me and my siblings, you know, I, always won't, I won't always be here. You know, is there anything you want to ask me? And we, he would bring us up at meals throughout the, you know, throughout the year, and he would, he would be like, oh, Dad, why do you guys talk like that? And, you know, that's kind of morbid, you know. But in all actuality, it was honest, it was smart, and it was helpful to our family matters, and it created memories, and it eventually eased the grief of losing him. He designed my mother and his gravestone in 2006 when my mom passed away. The stone was removed at the time of his death so it could be finished. And on the front of the gravestone, uh, at the bottom, closest to the grave, is the engraving, Be Prepared. And it's the scout motto, and my dad was a Boy Scout. But over the last few years, through my faith, I've realized that dad meant something more than that. And I mean, to have Be Prepared on your gravestone. You know, it's quite poignant and carries a little bit of weight. So it's obviously meant for people to read, mainly me, my siblings, loved ones, friends, uh, but also those just walking by. So you read it, be prepared. How? You know, well, be prepared to end up here. How? By packing your bag. With what? Start with accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Follow Jesus' teachings as best you can. There, there are five on the front of our bulletin today. Communicate with God through prayer and build and maintain that unique confidence that is in God's promise. That unique confidence is faith. Am I prepared? Do I have a pack bag? Yes, I have one, but I'm still packing another. My dad knew that nothing could separate him from the love of God, especially death. His bags were packed, and at the end, we won't always know the end. I know he was standing in that holy, he was a pilot, so he was standing in that holy TSA line. And he was ready to board that promise that is in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. God bless you all.